Yes, hello everybody, welcome um, to this first session of the Seminaire Commun du Larca. I'm sorry, I had a, a, a last minute problem of connection, of course. So, um, yes, I'm Cecil Hudo, I'm head of LARCA, um, the research center in Anglophone studies uh, um, at, at Université de Paris. Um, so, in the name of, of LARCA, I'd just like to say how um, Jean-Christian Vinel and I are happy that this first seminar should give us the opportunity to pay homage to Robert Mankin's memory, um, who was not only a mainstay of LARCA, but also one of its founders uh, with his acolyte and friend, François Brunet. Um, so when Ariane Fento and Sophie Vassé told me about um, the publishing of forms, formats, and the circulation of knowledge, edited by Benedict Miyamoto and Louisiane Ferlier, we immediately agreed that it should be presented at LACA. So we want to thank Benedict Miyamoto, whom I'm personally delighted to see again um, after a few years, and Louisiane Ferlier, whom I don't know yet. Um, thank you both for agree agreeing to present forms, formats, and the circulation of knowledge, British Princecapes Innovations, 1688-1832, published with Brill this year. Um, we also thank um, uh, Jeffrey Hopes, who's been a regular at LARCA and who has kindly agreed to join us tonight. So I'm very touched to see um, so many people tonight for this seminar, which is uh, more than a homage, in fact, which is a, a living testimony, I, I believe, for that um, someone's oeuvre goes on and generates new ideas, even if uh, the author is, alas, no longer with us. So thank you all. Um, um, thank you, uh, Ayan and Sophie and Ayan. Uh, um, I don't know if uh, now you have something else to say or... If, Not really. No. Nope. Okay. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Benedict and uh, Louisiane, then. Thank you all. So I think we're we're going to start with Jeffrey Hopes, uh, who's actually a contributor to our book, and he is going to do a presentation. Sorry, Benedict. I thought I would. I thought I was going second, but I'll go first if oh. you prefer. <laughs> Are we going second or? Louisiane? Louisiane, shall I go first then? I think yeah. you said you would go first. Yeah, you said you'd go first, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you go first, Benedict. Definitely. I'll do it. Yeah. Let me just share my screen. All right. Um, so before we start, we, we'd also like to thank the co-organizers of the conference this book was born from. Uh, so we'd like to thank uh, Will Slaughter from the LACA um, and Emmanuel Avril and Sarah Pickard from uh, my own university for their support during the conferences. Um, so digital technology has led to a, a renewed aesthetic of bookishness, as Jessica Pressman um, has it. And she says it's a fetishized focus on the book bound reading object. So the book has come to represent knowledge harnessed and it's neatly paragraphed printed text um, has come to represent the ordering of ideas. Um, but in fact, David Wenberger warns that we should disassociate the shape of the book and the shape of knowledge. He says to think that knowledge itself is shaped like books is to marvel that a rock fits so well in its hole in the ground. So where does the epistemological standing of book come from? Their aura of authority, um, as well as many of the arguments pertaining to copyright. Well, many are derived from the format, from, for example, the consecration of first edition, um, the high prices of large folios um, on the secondary market. But knowledge, sorry, excuse me. Sorry, my screen has gone.
sorry about this. Um, but knowledge came in many formats in the early modern and the modern period. So this is the answer shaped by all the chapters in this book um, coming together to, to shape this answer. The first part of our book um, looks at the working of professional networks, uh, how they were informed by the production of knowledge. For example, from the choice of titles, um, the structuring of layouts, the body of paper. So the material reality of the books was dependent on tensions between the actors of the trade. And it was also inscribed in an evolving legal framework. And this legal framework was actually playing catch up with the busy transaction of a tight knit community. The transaction of this community are exemplified by our first chapter by James Braben, who's in the room ready to answer your questions later on. Um, his study is that of job printing. And I quote him, it's the job printing is this multitude of quick, unromantic, practical productions, which form the staple of a printer's trade. And so most accounts of the development of printing with movable type investigates the production of books and then also periodicals and newspapers. What is usually ignored is the printer's output of non-book printing. But as this chapter presents it, the, the sheet fractional printing is, was actually central to the printing community and it can help us recover the printing house practices. It can help us recover, for example, patronage structures, um, economic usages, such as the importance of cash flow and the steady turnover that this jobbing permitted. This study actually helps us to see the book as a risk. All publishers face high, up, um, high upfront and one-off investments coupled with potentially very slow returns for subscription books. And so the liquidity predicament heightened the importance of surefire calculable undertakings like the job printing. The second chapter is Jeffrey Holt's chapter, and he reassesses booksellers as corporate groups with both local and international reach to reckon with, um, convincingly showing that publishers and booksellers had not only gained an authority, but that this authority was long-standing. It was an important foreground in the history of copyright. And here we can see on the slide, um, the subject of uh, Jeffrey Holt's chapter, John Dunton. The chapter is followed by um, a chapter by Rebecca Schock Curtin, who further shows this idea, the idea that the authoritative position of publishers and booksellers was already recognized in the early modern period. It was a long-standing authority. And she explores the transactions between authors and publishers um, since she, she proves that publishers' leverage was reflected in the ownership of the right to copy. And here um, you have a, um, an extract from um, uh, the, the uh, stationist printers. So those articles brought together form our first part on the working of the professional networks. And in this first part, we see the role played by economic pressures uh, the role played by peer transactions in creating the printed forms. And Isabella Alexander, the closing chapter of this first part, also underlines the role of law in creating these printed forms. She investigates um, copyright statutory origins, which lie in an act which proclaimed its purpose to be the encouragement of learning. However, the monopolistic uh, property rights created by that act were frequently deployed for exactly the reverse to restrict dissemination of knowledge. So here the tensions were relieved inside the profession by the profession itself. 
um, they allowed some copying to take place as long as improvements were also made. And so this is what the chapter um, investigates because by doing so, the profession as a whole assured its enlightenment concerns for the circulation of scientifically based knowledge. Um, in this chapter, geographical knowledge um, as an element of copyright law and using the concept of fairness. The second part of the book um, shows that knowledge was performed in print in a multitude of shapes, of sizes, and the scholars of the history of the book are grappling to recover its imaginative variety. Um, they're looking into the non-standard variants in size, in genre, and in respectability. And this is a material turn that animates book history as a discipline. And so our volume replaces some of the overlooked parts of this communication circuit, overlooked precisely because there were non-standard formats. So for example, we have David Duff showing us that reference works were presented in folio while narrative contemporary drama and poetry generally came in quarto editions, um, contrasting authority of the folio versus the ephemerality uh, of the quarto. Um, so to a certain extent, genre was or could be deduced from format. But as David Duff's study shows in the volume, although encyclopedia paraded their authority in a large folio format, the trade also relied on the ingenious inclusivity of small formats uh, from, for example, Shorter Encyclopedia and uh, from all those uh, books which purported to be, I quote, portable indexes to the larger encyclopedias, um, to prospectuses, and even to the circulation of sample pages, those freestanding advertising devices for publishing projects. So this question of the variety of format is also taken up by Yvonne Cornish, um, who is also in the room ready to answer your questions. Um, the question of format reveals uh, that jaw boundaries, the ones we know of, we talk of, uh, we define, um, actually rarely represent the constant adaptation of contact of content, a constant adaptation of content which is at play in the hand press world, as Yvonne Cornish shows when she looks at the publishing success of the Vauxhall Affray. Um, the Vauxhall Affray is this um, scandal that erupted in the newspaper and where the author publisher used the potential of a very close knit integrated print industry to connect a whole range of different products newspapers, journals, periodicals, and pamphlets, letters and squibs, poems and cards, all coming together to produce this blockbuster success. He then reshaped them on the page um, to his advantage. Pamphlets and broadsides also provide the key sources for the intermediate replication of ideas during the first half of our period in the chapter of Craig Spence. He shows that these formats anticipated the sensationalism of newspapers, for example, in their treatment of accidental deaths. And these accidental death um, news were influenced by the bill of mortality formats, their formats, their layout were reproduced as a seal of approval of reliability. And so Craig Spence studies the range of editorial choices, the forms, the formats that were available to publishers of these stories, these stories of accidents and disaster. And he shows how it enabled a mix of, on the one side, providential discourse, moralizing gossip, but all of this with a veneer of accuracy and fresh, hot, hot off the press news. And here you can see an extract from one of those true reports. 
Um, printers and publishers had a range of editorial choices indeed. And, and the volume includes, for example, cartographic objects, which were sold alongside other printed goods, marking the most distinct uh, yet integrated part of this very large print market. And this chapter by Catherine Parker shows that globes acted as intermediary objects. They offered a contrast to books, to pamphlets, to sheet maps, because they presented a three-dimensional visual and tactile experience. And they both complemented and complicated the print material that was sold alongside. Their precise utility opened also to ongoing negotiations. These ongoing negotiations that variety of format entailed is the central theme to the volume. And it's best exemplified by Jacqueline Reed Walsh's chapter on turn up books and their enduring popularity. And here you have a wonderful image of a turn up book where the flax is supposed to open up and down and you are supposed to play with it. And this chapter shows the readers eager and well-versed in the interactive and even the subversive reception of paper and of text, the playability of paper and folds and the manipulability of paper and page. Printers, lastly, did not only have a range of editorial choices, but also a range of type from cast to size and from where to, found, to font. So the page, its form and format were also shaped at the atomic level. Um, nowadays with Unicode Consortium, uh, it undergirds most computer-based representation we know um, through its character encoding standards. And it codifies a resistance, um, a contemporary resistance to seeing typography as a historical project. But James Asher, who's also in the room to answer your questions, um, recovers in his chapter, the trade relations and the networks between publishers and the sort of work they could print given the sort of type they had. As much as intellectual property law restricted what could be printed, we also have to think that possessing types to print restricted printing too, and the choice of printed books you could do. So to conclude, the motivation of this collection of essays was to map some of the constraints and the choices of formats observed across the book trade. Um, we wanted to consider how the distribution of knowledge resulted not only from the intellectual impetus of the authors, um, but was affected directly by material factors, by legislative factors, and by commercial factors. To finally understand how knowledge was shaped in collaboration and through adaptation of content. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Jeffrey, you're next. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I, I'll try not to repeat too much what Benedict has just said. I, I'm, I'm going to just uh, make a few remarks on the on the book as a whole, um, which I, I read sort of, um, I mean, having followed it from the beginning, I thought I'd read it slightly differently and sort of, and I actually put the title aside. I left the title aside. It makes a big difference when you forget the title of something. And so this is just a few remarks on the on the different chapters. Um, um, uh, uh, by now, as I understand it, um, most of you who have contributed to it have, have got the book. You've actually got the, the published version. Is that right? No? Because Benedict said, you, you said she had one. I got mine, mine yesterday. Oh, right. Mine is still okay. lost in the British Post. Well, mine's lost in the French Post. So <laughs> anyway, I don't have it. I know that when I do have it, it, you always say the same thing. Ah, here it is, the fine, the finished product. This is, you know, we've got the actual. This is what we've been working up to, as it were. 
here it is and it's sort of finished, a finished product. But I, I don't think the finished product is what matters in, in the book. I think, I think the book is always, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a process. It's the process of production that is often what you remember most about the book, especially you know, when you contribute to it. Book. I mean, you remember the the research, the conferences, the writing, the correcting, the rewriting, the editing, the discussions, proofreading, all the rest of it. Right? And all that is seems to me is so important um, to the um, to the idea of a of, of a printed object. I won't say a book because it's so much more than just books. Um, this, and this materiality, if you like, this material dimension of books, is, it seems to me this is what um, the, the, the book we're talking about today is, is principally about. It's, it's so much about the materiality of, of, of print. Um, uh, at a time in the late 17th to 18th, right up to the early 19th century, when I think um, there was a constant awareness of the material dimensions, constraints, and opportunities of book production, not just on the part of, of authors and printers and booksellers and stationers and, and so on, but of readers as well. I think readers were constantly aware um, of, of these issues, perhaps more so than today. That's, that's just an impression I have. So in fact, a book is never finished. It's a, it's a constant process of production, reception, transformation, adaptation, reassessment, criticism. Um, print, it's, print presents itself as, a, as finished, but it is above all process. And delving into these processes is a truly, is a, is, is truly fascinating. And the book does this from so many different angles, building up a sort of tapestry of detailed analyses of that, that, that open up different ways of reading. And, and I think the book enlarges our knowledge of, of Printscape um, in, in this period. So although the title uh, of the book is, is Forms, Formats and, and Circulation, I, I'm going to structure my brief remarks around four slightly different um, and connected categories. First, the material objects of Printscape, um, then the actors of print production and diffusion, Questions of ownership and profit and copyright, and then the market for print, which includes the whole process of diffusion and circulation. Um, these themes seem to me to be raised throughout the book in different but complementary ways. If I were to characterize what all the contributors have in common, it is the way they approach these questions um, uh, uh, with, a, with, a, with a constant attention to detail. The detail, the desire to escape generalizing meta narratives in order to descend to the nitty gritty uh, of, uh, of, 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 of the production and circulation of knowledge in print. I think we all share the immense pleasure that comes from micro analysis, from micro history, if you like. Um, um, the uh, the the way in which we we come across hidden corners, uh, unexpected unexpected details, and the way these things raise constantly raise new and unexpected questions. The cumulative effect is not one of building up to some grand overarching uh, assessment theory but of setting up a myriad of links or resonances or possibilities, a kaleidoscope of ever-changing viewpoints, which unlocks and liberates the energy that went into the production of print, which I think informs the research uh, into it that this book, um, that our book, uh, exemplifies. So first, just a few brief, brief words on the objects studied in the book. And they are incredibly varied. If I can just, I've just copied a few illustrations from the, um, from the book, if I can now hand it to, uh, oh, yeah, that was the car. Uh, that the car. Okay. Um, my computer is slow. There we come. 
Okay. So, um, so to begin, it's on its way. Says I'm in the process of sharing my screen. So this process. Um, anyway, James Raven studies the jobbing uh, in this chapter on the jobbing work of printers um, that enable them to acquire the financial stability necessary to the undertaking of larger, more risky projects. Um, it, um, now I really like the fact that the first chapter of this book, um, after Benedict and Louisiane's excellent introduction, um, is, um, I'm not quite sure what this, what this is not coming up. Um, we, we can't really see, Geoffrey. Nor can uh, I, nor can I. Yeah, I think you need <laughs> to come back to the beginning of your slideshow. You're just on the last slide. That's that's what the problem is, I think. I don't, no, I don't think I've got it at all. Okay. Because I'm, oh. well, maybe, but I, I've got no no to way of navigating the... on it. Oh, so you probably need to. I've just got a blank screen, basically. Is it, we just see click to end. So can you just try and click somewhere? Oh, there ah. you go. You're right. Hang on. Now I've got to get rid of this. You need to press the back arrow, I think. We're going to see oh, yeah. it backwards. Get back to the beginning. <laughs> I'm actually get back to the end. Just reverse order. Spoilers! <laughs> Replay. Okay, I've got it. Okay, so it's just a few, I just copied a few of the um, illustrations from the book. So, for example, um, um, uh, James Raven's sort of. Um, um, illustrations this is a bit of lading uh, uh, of this sort of mass of uh, uh of printed well to us it is ephemeral but of course were essential documents absolutely essential documents for the people who were who were um who were using them um and i like the way that the, the book starts with the modern book production placing printing at the center which is where it should be these little snips of print, like the just like the advertisements and the prospectuses that David Duff examines, uh, objects that I think we have all encountered uh, often fortuitously in the course of our research, and, and of course so many of which have just disappeared, they, they give us a real insight into what printers were actually doing and enable um, book production to be placed within the context of a much wider production of printed um, material. Um, Isabel Alexander, of course, studies the, the, the blossoming map trade. Um, not here. Here we are. Um, a one that catered for the practical needs of merchants and mariners, enabled increasingly scientific and precise charting of space, nourished narrow travel, uh, travel narratives of all sorts, real and imaginary. And in often luxurious editions, provided an anachronism, but coffee table books for armchair travelers, but also fed an increasing demand for educational and recreational materials, as she shows. Um, Yvonne Cornish points to the importance of advertising, puffs, and frontispieces as tools of self promotion in the affair of the Vauxhall Affray. Um, the, the, the Vauxhall Affray really interested me. Oh, hang on, that's, that's a tough, yeah, that's the, um, uh, a prospectus to the Encyclopedia Britannica that David Duff then uh, gives us. Um, and the, um, the, uh, the, the Vauxhall Affray reminded me um, uh, greatly of uh, Dunton's uh, The Dublin Scuffle, which I talk about in my, in my chapter. And, um, very very close in many of its um, its um, its concerns, um, and of course Catherine pa uh, Catherine Parker discusses these globes and who we are that the, that as she sees as as Benedict said as intermediary objects. That's a phrase I think that um, resonates with other sectors of printing material. Um, and I would like to quote um, Catherine briefly. Um, the precise utility, utility of globes was open to ongoing negotiation. They were determined as much by the user as by the globe maker and underlined the instability of objects, meanings in space, the object's meanings in space and time. So this, this constant interaction between 
producer and receiver, as well as the notions of negotiation and instability, are questions that I think are fundamental. Um, I'll come back to them in a minute. Um, Craig Spence delves into the sensational reporting of violent events in a variety of pr printed material, newspapers, pamphlets, ballads, bills of mortality. And uh, Jacqueline, uh, Jacqueline Reed Walsh writes about these turn-up books, fascinating objects, I didn't know them before, that again, like Globes, call upon the reader to reconfigure material, which itself is constantly adapting to different readerships, a process that she suggest suggestively calls remediation. Um, I quote her, uh, a reader has to engage with the interactive format to make sense of the text. That's the conclusion. And as for James uh, P. Asher, he brings us down to the fundamental building blocks of the entire print enterprise, the type blocks and the compositors who chose and arranged them. Here again, what strikes me is the fluidity of the process that Asher describes, the lack of standardization, the capacity to adapt and to innovate. So I'll now move briefly to the actors of print production. Um, this is one of the great strengths of the book, I think, to to situate authorship is just one among many trades and skills which enable printed words uh, in printed works to exist and to find a readership. Dunton, who I, I myself study, lists all these different participants in, in the print trade in his The Life and Errors of John Dunton of 1705. Printers, booksellers, the binders, illustrators of all sorts, uh, copper plate engravers, uh, woodcut uh, artists, um, stationers, and at the end, licenses. The professional and also clearly at times the personal relationships between different um, um, figures on the printscape, um, landscape, uh, print, uh, the printscape, <laughs> are again characterized by constant adaptation and flexibility. David Duff insists on the way prospectuses were elabor elaborated as joint productions by authors and booksellers. And Rebecca Schoff Curtin's study of the way printers, authors, and publishers negotiated particular uh, agreements gives us a much clearer idea of what was going on than the simple narrative of a legal and legislative framework that was free, frequently simply ignored. We should never forget how small a geographical space the actors of the London print trade inhabited and the degree to which they were in constant social and professional contact. Uh, Benedict insisted, has insisted in her work uh, on, on this aspect of the art market. In that um, negotiation seems to be the key word here, with many agreements and arrangements being concluded orally. Litigation brings to light the complexity of the issues involved and, of course, highlights those moments when conflicting interests were irreconcilable without recourse to the law. But most of the time, constant negotiation and discussion enabled such litigation to be avoided. Certainly, the interests of printers, booksellers, and authors, the name but them, were frequently opposed. The situation complicated even further when one person, such as John Dunton, or others, was at one and the same time author, printer, bookseller, member of the stations, the stationers company, and most importantly of all for Dunton, um, um, well nigh bankrupt. Yet the overriding impression that our book exudes is of an intricate web of relations which is constantly adapting to such constraints as the price of print materials, government taxes, and changing public demand. Um, I was going to say something about the, the questions of ownership and copyright, but I think these are a bit more familiar, I think, to, to, to most of us. Um, so I won't say, uh, won't say too much about it. Um, except that I think the copyright and ownership need to be um, uh, assessed within the context of the constantly changing market in printed materials, a market that demanded, as it does today, a large number of prospective and so risky decisions as to the possible success or failure of individual production. And it was a market that was not necessarily expanding at the end of the 17th and beginning of the 18th century, to, contrary to a common trope about the print revolution and so on, but one whose productive capacity led to the search for new markets, both in the form of new sorts of readers and readership 
and in a greater geographical uh, outreach. Authors, printers, illustrators, and booksellers all sought not just to respond to public demand, but to create such demand through the production of increasingly innovative and creative materials. Like any business activity, the print trade wanted the security and the basic assurances that would enable them to innovate and take risks. Questions of proprietor proprietorship need to be seen within this business context as part of a complex negotiation between shifting interests. And finally, a brief word about circulation. Um, we'll ask you to look at. Uh, oh, there's, the, there's the, um, these little flaps that come down and create unexpected combination. <laughs> um, not to the fray, but you know, John Dunton's front is self promotion, of course. Self promotion, self promotion and a declaration of authorship and of propriety. Um, Defoe does the same thing at a similar time. I love this one. <laughs> Death's masterpiece. Um, anyway, um, okay, just briefly about um, uh, circulation. Um, here again, the essential link between what is being produced and the markets that such production is responding to or seeking to, seeking to generate emerges clearly from the different chapters of the book. The way that reports of violent events change um, from providence-based narratives to more factual and pithy newspaper accounts as described by Craig Spence. Um, the extraordinarily flexible format of Chaplin Reed Walsh's turn-up books or Catherine Parker's Globes, the huge expansion of demand for maps generating increasing um, questions of copyright, the massive, if today largely invisible, use of advertising through prospectuses that David Douglas describes, all of these point to a conscious effort to tap into what was seen as an underexploited market potential. Sermons and almanacs, reprints of classic works such as, such as Fox's Martyrs or Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, along with all the jobbing work that James Raven describes might continue to constitute the base on which such innovations could prosper. But increasingly, they were no longer sufficient in themselves. Dunton's book auctions clearly reflect this need for a solid, I might say stolid, uh, base and the search for innovation and market receptiveness on the other hand. The risks he took were often inconsiderate. But the way his activities as an author mesh with his book selling activities are indicative of the way authorship, printing, selling, and diffusion were inextricably linked. Uh, that's, that's, that's enough. Um, uh, I was left rereading the book um, with, with so many different other areas that I'd like, <laughs> I think we could explore. So possibly another book. I mean, one thing, for example, I, 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 I would be very interested in is music publishing, which is not touched on. Um, and, and the whole, the whole, just the, the, the technical side of, of music publishing is, is, is just absolutely fascinating. But there are many, many other dimensions that could be explored. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, if I can take uh, take over the theme that you've just opened, um, what I really wanted to talk about tonight was also the book as fluidity and as, per as uh, a process. Um, and as a process, because it is a continuation of discussions that um, were started with Robert Mankin, and that's why we wanted to uh, dedicate the volume to um, Robert's memory. Um, but also as fluid because we are in the digital age and we are actually uh, launching a book which is about materiality in digital formats and I think it tells us quite a lot so um, just to show that the book is never finished um, I'm now going to actually talk about um, digital formats and how we're bringing um, early modern formats um, to the digital age um, which is really what, um, what I've been busy doing um, with my work, sorry, I've, I'm trying to uh, share my PowerPoint. There you go. Uh, so many of you will know that um, Robert Mankin supervised my doctoral research. Fewer of you may know that he also supervised my masters. 
Um, but during all that time, the majority of our conversations um, really revolved around the universe of knowledge and uh, its evolutions, the movements of the small constellations within it, um, how those constellations responded to converging influences, intellectual, material and commercial. And he encouraged me to um, question particularly how the material circulation of knowledge interacted with um, the diffusion of the intellectual message. And that's a central theme in our, in our volume um, and um, really a, a theme that I think we need to carry on within the digital age. So um, with every technological revolution comes a reshaping of knowledge and the parallels between the early modern adoption of print um, and our digital age have been done, made and pointed out many times before. But I really think that COVID-19 has accentuated and accelerated our reliance on digital technology, including for early modern studies. So um, to pursue the emphasis of our book on forms and formats, um, what I'd like to offer now are, are some practical reflections as to what digitization of early modern prints reveals of the limitation of digital platforms, and in turn, what they tell us of the format specificities uh, which uh, were published in the period and which are covered uh, by our volume. I will illustrate those challenges by focusing on two examples from the larger portfolio of the Royal Society collections. First of all, it's um, scientific periodical, which uh, was published continuously uh, from 1665 onwards, the philosophical transactions. And uh, one of its imprimatur published the very same year, uh, Robert Hooke's Micrographia. Um, by the way, my opening slide includes the first obvious limitation of digital technology as um, the image that I've included uh, is one of the matrices that were huge, used by Cambridge University Press to print the Royal Society journals. And we have the matrix now in our collections. But really this, this image gives you absolutely no idea of the size of the object, um, of the weight of the object, um, and I think uh, it would be quite a good guess for you to uh, tell me how big it is and how you think how big you think this mat matrix is. And I I'm guessing most of you would get would get it wrong. Um, but let me move back in time to when the philosophical transactions um, were first printed. Um, so as I've just mentioned, philosophical transaction um, starts in 1665, um, and the date corresponds to a more general appetite for um, periodical publications, which is discussed in, in various chapters of, of the volume. The idea of publishing the latest news, scientific or, or not, at regular intervals resulted from the increased efficiency of printing presses and the resulting lower cost of publication. And certainly the format itself um, has been successful since it endures um, in the digital age. But as you can already see, just by glancing at um, the shelves uh, within the Royal Society's uh, uh, library, the length and the size of the volumes change dramatically over time. It goes from quite a small uh, volume to very, very large ones, um, both in terms of length and in terms of, uh, of format. And when in 2017, when we set out to digitize all of those journals, um, we immediately encountered challenges because of this evolution and uh, the incompatibilities between the format of current digital scientific publications and their early modern predecessors, I think reveals quite a lot um, about um, what we're looking at when we're looking at um, early modern uh, scientific journals. So, sorry. As we've grown dependent on, on search engines for research, one of the key aspects of digitizing a textual print has become to make it discoverable. When we look at a physical book, we're used to using the paratext, the indices, the table of contents. But when we look online, we just want to search for a keyword and immediately be led to a certain page. Now, how do you do that when you're trying to digitize a book in an early modern font, which is less regularized and very often where the ink has bled through the paper? There are some technologies that answer that, 
mostly optical character recognition, but actually when you're using it on early modern content, it just stumbles upon systematic problems. And the long S is particularly still a problem for optical character recognition. So for philosophical transactions, we did use optical character recognition, which got us about 70 to 80% of uh, the text, which is not too bad. Uh, but we needed to rely on people actually looking at individual articles and creating uh, an individual article uh, uh, entry um, for all of those. So in total, we ended up indexing over 46,000 articles and um, we digitized 740,000 odd pages. Uh, which means that it was a long process. But I thought quite revealing to actually see the difficulties that um, the technology itself was encountering. So again, going back to James uh, Asher's uh, chapter on, on the importance of the type and how uh, current technology can reproduce it or fail to reproduce it, but also how the indexers who were looking at the articles stumbled themselves um, on problems of vocabulary, just understanding uh, what the article titles were. And one of the things that we couldn't do, for instance, was ask those indexers to choose a category um, with which to tag individual articles, because we couldn't ask them to tag something as physics if we were talking about the 17th century, because physics would be anachronistic, quite obviously. Um, sorry. Another problem that we encountered were actually that of, of dates. So on the surface, modern scientific articles are structured in the same way and modern scientific journals are structured in the same way than they were in the 17th century. You have a volume, you have an issue and you have an article. But in fact, the early modern uh, editors were very flexible in the way they were applying this structure. So for instance, you can see for volume one, uh, the image um, which is to the left of my, of my screen, um, that the volume one was actually gathering two years rather than a single year. And then sometimes an individual issue would have a date, uh, a specific date on, in this instance for number one, Monday, the 6th of March, 1660. And there you have another problem that uh, digital technology has a hard time with, old date and new date. But some actually gather, you know, just give us a, 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 a printed for the months plural of January, February and March. And again, the digital technology does not allow us to give, they're not that flexible. They don't let us tell, tell, uh, tell the users that this was published for a whole period and not at a specific date. And actually we're still three years on trying to correct the errors of uh, dates uh, that this flexibility of early, uh, early modern editors uh, 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 resulted into. And the fact that the digital technology on the other hand is absolutely not flexible. Another set of challenges come from the fact that um, modern scientific articles uh, are the current unit of reading um, for digital journals, but it wasn't the case for um, the early modern period. It was the issue and it was the volume that counted for the editors. And for instance, where a modern article will want a specific date for, uh, for its, um, its article at the article level, sorry, uh, we cannot provide a specific date for one specific article just for a whole issue for the 17th century. Another issue as well is the fact that, um, as you can see on the second image, the uh, articles could begin in the middle of a page rather than at the top of the page. And for illustrations, uh, a single illustration could refer to several articles. So really what we would like to do would be to give several levels um, of browsing to users so that they can look at a full volume, look at a full issue, or look at an individual article. But this is not something that modern platforms for scientific journals actually allow. So at the moment, you can only look at a, full, a, a single article, but not at, at the full volume or the full issue. Um, these challenges around dates and units of reading, reading sorry, tell us really about of the flexibility with which early modern editors approach the notion of a periodical. And I think in particular, the grouped illustrations revealed that they didn't consider that articles could circulate on their own. For them, it was the issue that circulated. To remain on the topic of um, early modern illustrations, but switch to a completely different type of publication formats, in the same period, um, 
1665, the Royal Society commissioned its curator of experiments, Robert Hooke, to publish the experiments he had been conducting with a microscope for the Fellows of the Royal Society since 1664. And this gave us micrographia. Um, in some ways, micrographia could have perfectly been published as part of the philosophical transactions. Um, the observations, the microscopic observations, had been taken individually, looked at various uh, 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 samples, and they could have made individual articles perfectly well. So it is quite telling that instead of including micrographic uh, observations within the philosophical transactions, the choice was made to format them in a large folio volume. As an aside, it is worth remembering that um, upon the death of uh, the first editor of the Philosophical Transactions, uh, Henry Oldenburg, when Hooke inherited the uh, editorship um, of the Philosophical Transactions, he chose to stop the publication of the periodical to create his own philosophical collections rather than the Philosophical Transactions. And I'm happy to discuss why this choice was made um, in, uh, as part of our conversation afterwards. Anyhow, um, just as with the philosophical transactions, um, uh, micrographia was printed under the printing privilege of the Royal Society, the imprimatur that you can see here on the front page. However, it is, uh, it is really interesting to see within the minutes of the society that um, the fellows distance themselves from it. They insist that Hook includes in the introduction a note that the work was his own and that the Royal Society was not responsible for the content. Um, I think this is a telling part of the story in terms of intellectual responsibility. Um, last summer, the, we digitized um, um, micrographia, and um, you can see here the animated version um, that you can find online. Our copy of uh, micrographia um, has something quite different from the other ones that you can find online, which is that you have access to the full text, which you can see on the side of the screen. And so you can search through the full text, as well as having um, the images and being able to actually turn the pages um, of the volume itself. Um, it was really important for us um, to give a sense of the materiality of the object. Um, because we had annotations that were added to um, the volume itself, but particularly because of the role of the illustrations and the way the illustrations were inserted within the volume. Uh, Hook actually uh, only uses a plate number rather than titles. So you can navigate um, quite easily using the, uh, uh, the menu from plate to plate, but you can then also search for, for uh, what the plate actually describes within the full text. Um, we used a, an, an existing transcription um, of, the, of the book, uh, but um, structured it in a way that um, it allows you to have this index, which is on the side. But I'd like to close on a few remarks um, on one of the main limitations of switching from um, material analog format to digital, which is the loss of the manual interactivity, the loss of the 3D objects, and the loss of the understanding of size, which I already mentioned briefly. The technology that um, we've chosen for micrographia is called turning the pages and it uses basic 3D rendering to allow users to flick through the pages. It accounts for the rigidity of the paper uh, as opposed to vellum. Um, and I think it just allows um, viewers to uh, realize how large the plates which are included uh, within micrographia are and the effects of this, uh, the, how large the plates are compared to the text. Um, obviously, Robert Hooke trained um, with one of the greatest painters of his time, Peter Lilly, and he drew the uh, illustrations himself. So I, I really think that the choice to include very large foldouts um, was um, approved by Hooke and corresponds to his um, choice of scale, first of all, scientific scale between, uh, between the observation and the plate, but also it's, it's simply trying to provoke an effect in the viewer which is uh, why it was so important for us to use this type of technology to, uh, to reproduce micrographia. But there is still something that I think escapes us when we're doing digital recreation. And I'm still not particularly satisfied with, uh, with the digital recreation that we have here. Because for instance, um, we can only allow for a single action when unfolding the plates. Whereas in real life, you would have to carefully 
and slowly unfold every single flap one by one. Also, although the fiddling, the online fiddling to actually find all of those buttons on the side, which I've shown you quite seamlessly because I know where to find them, um, is perhaps the best way I could tell you that you have to be careful with manipulating the original, but it's still quite a frustrating process. I wish you could just have a simple manipulation, something a, a little bit closer um, to what the actual material object is. Uh, to close, I would simply want to say that um, there are even more challenging formats, um, which I would like to display, and that we don't have a solution for yet. Um, one of them is the Volvel, which we use to illustrate the cover of the volume. Um, all of those spinning dials, should, we should be able to actually find a simple way of recreating the spinning of the, uh, of the Volvel, and we don't have this. Or the anatom anatomical flipbook of uh, Johannes Romelius, uh, which, is, uh, which is to your right. These interactive paper constructions that um, Jackie Reed Walsh also talks about are really telling of the multiple ways in which early modern readers would engage with the material to gain knowledge. Um, but they're also indications of the limitations of di te digital technology to capture this, this in, a, in an affordable way. So um, I, I was just hoping that this would be an invitation for um, everyone um, uh, in the seminar to, to question how the digital resources are made, um, question what they can do, and also to just remember to visit the libraries and the archives in person um, so that they can actually look at what the material is like and what it does to them when they uh, look at it in, in person. And we will as soon as we can. <laughs> as soon as you can. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeffrey, Benedict, and, and Louisiane for this uh, very engaging, interesting presentation of your book. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing it, uh, it in its all, all its materiality. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it reminded me of Robert because, you know, Robert always brought me back to you know, the printing conditions, the subscriptions, um, the price of the book, uh, the networks of, of printing when I was all focused on the text. So I really, I think, you know, this is a very uh, wonderful homage tribute to, to pay to his intellectual uh, way of, of approaching the early modern um, text. Uh, so I will open the, the, the floor or the, the online uh, discussion. If anyone has a question, you can raise your hand or enter the question in, in the chat if you prefer. Okay, meanwhile, I can ask my first question. We will try and keep it very rather short because we did say it would end at eight at 6.30. So, we'll, you know, we can linger a little until say quarter two. Uh, I did have one question if nobody has a question yet, which was you, you, both of you mentioned that globes were an object of negotiation. Can you be a little more, like can you expand on this and explain why you would say that? Well, I think, um... Katie Parker would say it much better than us. Um, and Isabella um, also would talk about geographical knowledge better than us. But um, it's an object on negotiation because of the materiality involved and the fact that you have, you have to manipulate it. Um, you have to, to understand how it works. And also it's a negotiation because most of the time, uh, the fact that it, um, um, the fact that it's a 3D object that's mimicking the actual thing is also an obstacle to its use. Um, uh, one, of the one of the many conclusion of Katie Parker's chapter, for example, uh, was about how unreliable those globes, globes were, um, how they were, how they came to um, become iconic for geographical knowledge because they looked like the real thing 
but in fact they were very very hard to use and they became quite quickly decoration i think we can all relate to this the fact that still i mean if if you've gone to any online class the icon will be a little globe um you'll you'll see them in classroom um i don't think i've ever used them in class i don't think you know and they're they've come to represent knowledge accessible whereas in fact you need quite a lot of series of steps of negotiation to actually get to the knowledge which you would get to actually quicker through 2d print so it's a negotiation between all the formats that you're trying to cram all the knowledge that you're trying to cram into one object mm -hmm. there are other aspects in Louisiana I suppose you can yeah, I think maybe another uh, another part of the negotiation is um, between the gathering of geographical knowledge and then its reuse. So one of the things that Katie works on as well is how the expeditions, uh, so the knowledge gathering part of it is a negotiation between the observer and, and the land. Um, and I think one of the things that is quite striking is that because this process is so time consuming, it is very easy for a globe to be outdated. And that's one of the reasons why it becomes a decorative object as well is because the process that it takes from knowledge gathering, then representation, then production, and then the sale of the globe is so long mm -hmm. that by the time it arrives in the market, it's, it's nearly guaranteed to be outdated in, in the 17th and the 18th century mm -hmm. yeah. where it relies on exploration. I think, I think that's, that, that, in addition to what Benedict was saying, I think that's the other aspect of negotiation, which I think is quite interesting if you're thinking just of, of knowledge as being sold. Um, are you really selling knowledge if actually what you're selling is is, um, is irrelevant by the time you're selling it? Um, I think she had really good, Katie had really good example in her chapters. Um, and I remember at the, at the conference, she was showing how on the globe that we had within the the, the conference um, in Oxford, it had a the, the tracking of a specific voyage, which um, by that point had actually uh, failed. So, yeah, an, an, another type of, of, of negotiation, which I think uh, <laughs> was quite interesting, which was, you know, um, selling the success of Britain as this maritime nation um, mm -hmm. and flop. <laughs> okay. That's, a, that's an, another aspect of the, uh, you know, the printed book that's come to um, represent knowledge harnessed. Um, and we should always remember that it's such a time consuming process. It involves so many people, therefore so many possible errors that actually the printed book, um, we should think about it as already outdated. Um, whenever it comes out of the printing press, if it's not job printing that can be done quickly or filled in because many of the job printing they came out and the information's not there yet and you fill it in at the right moment, right? Whereas when the book comes out of the printing press, it's basically already outdated. I mean, um, all the people in the room who've been all contributors know how long this book has taken uh, since the conferences. Um, so it feels very fresh to us because we say hot off the press, but um, <laughs> it's not as hot as the on the day of the conferences. And, so there's been, you know, of course, additions and stuff. But so the the idea with the the printed maps, for example, this is very clear that the manuscript maps were working maps, military maps, for example, whereas the ones that are that end up in the printing shops are often outdated, need to be redone, and etc. And that's 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 the negotiation we're talking about too. I, the updates, a content user update and stuff. Thank you. That's very helpful. Ariane, I think you have something. Yeah. Uh, I was I was also fascinated uh, well, by the way your talks interlaced into kind of showing the flip side of well, the materiality of print and then the materiality of digitizing print and the, the very practical and material problems you have doing that. Um, I, I was particularly interested, I have to say, about the globe printing because it never, never crossed my mind that it was actually printed matter, uh, but of course it is. Um, and um, I know you, you didn't write that chapter, but 
do you know how they actually physically printed the paper to wrap around the globe itself? Yes, yeah, so it, it, it's, it's gauze. So it, yeah, I, I don't have the picture with me, but basically they print it as gauze. So you, you have um, you have almond shaped um, mm. parts which are uh, connected in the middle yeah. and then you wrap it around a wooden structure. So one of the other negotiations is that, is it furniture building or is it printmaking? Yeah, so I was going to say, so that's like, it also um, uh, requires different trades to come together because you've got the core, obviously the shape and the precise uh, size of the globe that you have to wrap it around. And, um, you know, you, you can't get, get it wrong. Otherwise it's the, the, the seams are not going to match. Although that's you right. say they're a little bit irrelevant straight off the, you know, off the press. Uh, I think we can all relate to that anyway. <laughs> no matter how long a book's taken to to print, we all know that the first time we open the book, we see uh, what we would do differently. That's right. I was also thinking, you know, this pocket globes, um, not only do you have the globe itself as an object, but you also have the pocket. Um, so the, the pocket globes always comes with its um, small shield and with a small box. And usually for pocket globes, it was a, a, a celestial map, which was inserted within um, within the box itself. And so you have two different two different um, maps that you're inserting. You have the celestial map, which is inside, which is actually um, sewn inside out. If you want, you know, it's, it's the lining is basically meant to um, be sewn this way, whereas the globe is going to be sewn that way, if that makes any sense to, um, to people. But um, all of these technologies, um, they are, they're extremely physical and they require um, the overlay of um, intellectual knowledge being, you know, uh, neatly uh, cut out in the shape that is then going to be reconstructed inside, outside. And I just, I find it quite, quite fascinating just looking at how much um, cutting and pasting is going on um, with those um, scientific um, material in particular. And I think one of the things that micrographia, but all books that have fold out just always make me think is just why, I mean, some of the time it's a question of scales and I understand, but sometimes there is no requirement to print something that big. You know, the number of folds within one book and how impractical it makes the object of the book um, and how delicate it makes it. Um, it's sometimes hard to justify for just having something of a larger scale. You could just have a slightly larger format of book. You could have a book that is slightly bigger, just overall, you wouldn't need to have those fold out sticking out. Um, and micrographia, a couple of the plates are extremely large, um, but most of them, the fold is literally just that much on each side of the paper. He could have printed it a little bit smaller and wouldn't have been fold outs. So some of the plates, I just wonder why they didn't just choose. Just make your life harder, Louisiane. <laughs> yes, but also because it's different people printing it, right? The, the plates are, are, are being actually produced in a separate place compared to the text. So there's, that, there's this as well. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just, yeah. And some of the time the paper is trimmed by, um, so the copy that we have was donated directly by Robert Hook, but um, it, so it was, it was a fresh copy. So it's not being used by that many people apart from readers at the Royal Society. So it's quite, it's not, um, it's nearly intact, it's, it's in a really good nick. Um, but you see in, in, other, in other more used, heavily used copies, you can see that just because they've inserted yeah, that tiny little bit on top, um, it, it's made the entire plate really fragile. So you're, you're sacrificing quite a lot just, just to make it that, that, that bit bigger. It's just for the, uh, the ta-da uh, moment of uh, opening up the fold, right? It oh. is, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, Louis, Louisiane, um, You've got the opposite um, phenomena, uh, phenomenon as well. Excessively small print. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. When, um, I work, for example, uh, on these um, chronologies uh, of the history of the world, where you, people are trying to sort of cram into a, just a double page the entire history of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally. Um, and of course, <laughs> it can't be done. But one way you can trying to it's just by reducing and reducing reducing the, the size of the prints so it becomes 
totally illegible. I mean, you cannot read it with the naked eye. You have to read it with a, with a magnifying glass. Yeah? And so you're, <laughs> uh, it's extraordinary, really. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe James knows more about this than I do, or I don't know. I mean, how do you, how do you produce such tiny print, such tiny, tiny print? That I think, presumably, yeah. there, there have, there, there are, they, they had them, um, that size type was available. To them. I mean, I'm talking about some mid 17th century. You know, the, I think the, James wanted to answer that. Sorry. One. Yeah. Well, I did, and just a brief comment. Yes, there was very tiny type available, and it's extraordinary. And of course, there was also very minuscule engraving, which was incorporated as well. So, but you're right. I mean, minuscule footnoting on some of those polyglot Bibles, uh, particularly <laughs> where you've got all this tiny, tiny. Uh, they're, they're, they are tiny, tiny fonts. Quite extraordinary, actually. I just wanted to add a, a comment, though, actually, just going back to the globes and, and the finishing, because something that struck me really forcibly when I looked through the city printers' um, records in relation to my, my printing work was, I'm, I hope you don't, sorry, my phone is just going off, I'm going to carry on, um, um, was um, that, try and keep my concentration, um, was that uh, uh, the, the finishing work was so important, um, and that it's a very important, not just in terms of finishing, like sort of finishing for the strips of the globe, um, but also a whole variety of different types of finishing trade. And that brings a very important sort of gender point as well, because a lot of women are particularly employed in this and they could be often invisible. So if you're thinking about women in the print trade as well and the book production process, that's really, really um, important. I'm going to, excuse me, I'll put my phone off. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just to carry on with what you were saying, Jeffrey, um, there's this uh, great editions of poets, um, uh, which um, is edited by Bell, um, and they're about that big. Um, and the whole point is to actually demonstrate that they're able to produce such small volumes. It is the whole point. It is a show of craftsmanship um, on, on their parts. There is no reason to edit those, um, those volumes in such small format, apart from trying to show off your, your craft. I think there's also the, the idea that people wanted to possess, right? And so mm. if you're publishing the classics, they, they want to have it all. Um, it's this idea, well, I'm quite attracted to the idea of the collection, right? So it's this idea that if you have it really small, you can carry it around. It's a bit like those tiny, tiny books that are used as ready reckoners and you think you'll have the answers to everything, except you can't read them when you need them, but you have it. And it's all those bizarre productions, yeah. Oh, coming back to this. Um, so why collections and not transactions anymore? Um, ah. <laughs> Lucian, from your, your talk. That was, that was mostly, that was mostly Robert Hooke um, hating Henry Oldenburg. So Hook and Oldenburg Old have this, sections. yeah, it's just <laughs> one of those feuds of the Royal Society. So Oldenburg is the first secretary and Hook being one of the few men um, who is elected a fellow who actually has no personal wealth. He needs the position much more um, than um, Oldenburg does. Um, so there's, there's a, a feud between uh, Oldenburg and, uh, and Hook, and Hook has his own idea of editorial, sh uh, of being an editor as well. Um, the very interesting thing is that Oldenburg's model for um, publishing the philosophical transactions is to actually gather all of the latest news he's receiving as um, an intelligencer and as part of his really wide network of correspondence. Robert Hook publishes the philosophical collections last seven issues, if I remember correctly. And it's all old stuff. Like none of it is like the latest scientific news. It's all pretty old stuff. It's amazing things. Like the, the articles are really amazing. The illustrations within it are, are, are fascinating. Um, but actually none of it is actually, is the latest scientific news. It is not reporting in the same way. What he's trying to um, demonstrate is that he has important correspondence rather than the latest correspondence. So where Oldenburg doesn't really mind inserting the, an article by um, someone from Somerset that no one knows who's just reporting on a um, meteorite uh, or just a phenomenon that might be of interest. Oldenburg just wants to publish that. 
Hook wants to show that he's writing to this person in 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 Italy. He he wants to demonstrate things in in a certain way. Um, so yes, it's philosophical collections rather than philosophical transactions. The transactions are commercial. Oldenburg is making an intellectual commerce. Hook is trying to demonstrate that as a creator of the Royal Society, he has more lofty idea, and it would be great if you could also pay him and make you know give him a, a paid job. That would be fantastic. Um, so I think they have a very different um, attitude um, towards the the, the, the journals. Both of the journals, the philosophical collections and transactions are online for free, by the way. So they're all on, on the Royal Society Journals website if they're, they're, they're available um, to anyone. So have a look at the philosophical collections because very few people have actually looked at them in details. And for instance, the plates are slightly different size. The volumes are slightly different size as well. They're even a little bit smaller than, um, than Oldenburg's transactions. But yes, it's a, I, like, I don't like you, Oldenburg. Um, so now that I'm taking over, I can get rid of the philosophical transactions. But it came back uh, as soon as Hook um, stopped being the editor. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think we 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 have unfortunately we have to stop here. But you can, mm -hmm. I'm sure you can email the the um, presenters for today if you have more questions. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful discussion presentation and for also. Um, I think the, the, the tribute that was paid to Robert Mankin today. Um, and I can't wait to read the book now. <laughs> Congratulations. Just a quick reminder as well that uh, Benedict will be talking again at Larca uh, on January 11. I think that's right, Benedict. And I think your title is Dirty Books, Stains and Holes in 17th and 18th Century Drawing Manuals. And it's part of a seminar digital materialities for people in, who are interested in the history of science. The, the seminar Thermalisme et Politique will start next month as well. So more, more events to look forward to. And um, well, I think uh, unless you have. I, I've been asked something very specific in the chat privately, which is what is the size of the matrix? So who, who ventures <laughs> a guess? How big is the matrix? A, I'm going to say it's really small. It is really small, so it's, oh, okay. <laughs> it's that big. So I don't know if you can see my face, but it's about that size. Um, mm. It's like this, but it's extremely heavy. So oh. um, yeah, it's it's extremely heavy. Okay, tiny but heavy. Okay. <laughs> just, well, just wondered. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's one of those things where because the photographer actually. Um, zoomed in quite a lot. It looks like it's this giant. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and because you used a back background, it looks like it's um, floating out of space. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's actually, it's a, yeah, it's this, it's this very small object, um, <laughs> which, which is just, just because of the background looks, it looks that small. So, <laughs> thank, you. thank you. All right, thank you very much, everyone, and see you soon. I hope. Thanks for attending the event. Take care. Oh, thank you, mm -hmm. Benedict, Louisiana, and Jeffrey. This was really absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Travel. Thank you.